What's up guys, this is Ray and welcome to Age of Feminists and today we'll be talking about the 2007 film D-War which is directed by Shim Hyung Rae. D-War or Dragon War stars Jason Burr and Amanda Brook and I gotta say when this movie first came out in the States back in 2007, that's 11 years ago, I watched it in the theater because I, I love Godzilla, I love giant monster movies, giant kaiju movies and I wanted to see something uh, some uh, like this you know something of that caliber with this movie and I didn't even know at the time that it was a Cree movie because at the time I just wanted to watch I just watched movies just because they're movies I had no clear uh, understanding that this was uh, produced and made in Korea and not until years later and that's because this movie stars mostly a Western cast uh, they do have a few Korean actors uh, once you dive into some of the flashback scenes but for the most part this movie is led by a Western cast and part of the cast is Robert Forster yeah like I think he's probably the the best actor who performs in this movie but long story short when I watched this in the theaters I remember falling asleep some way halfway through and then waking up somewhere uh, towards the final act or the final confrontation and I think uh, I mean just falling asleep in the monster movie I, I think that was evidence enough that I didn't have a good time at all when watching this movie it definitely wasn't what I expected and then I'll, and why as to why I'll go ahead and talk about that now so the story of D War uh, well, it's about uh, this young boy named Ethan, and he goes into this, I think it was an antique shop, run by this uh, old guy, this old dude named Jack, who's Robert Forster. And Jack informs Ethan of this old Korean legend that supposedly took place about 500 years prior. And uh, it's about the these two star-crossed lovers. Uh, the guy is this warrior who is assigned to protect this girl. Uh, and the girl, uh, inside the girl is this special magical pearl orb, I forgot exactly what it was, but it's called the Yo Yoyiju, I think I'm pronouncing it right, Yoyiju. Uh, and this magic pearl, it, once, it, it takes about 20 years to blossom. It takes 20 years to become, uh, to be at its full power. And once it's at its full power, the girl is meant to be sacrificed to this giant serpent called an Imugi. So this Imugi can uh, transform into a celestial dragon and then ascend to heaven. But however, there is this evil Imugi called Buraki and he wants his Yoyiju for himself so that way he can transcend into heaven. Uh, but in doing when in an attempt to do so, in an attempt to steal the Yoyiju, uh, the two star-crossed lovers jump into the sea and commit suicide together. But there's this prophecy that uh, it's supposed to manifest every 500 years. And with that being said, Jack tells Ethan that he is the reincarnation of the warrior who protects the the girl with the Yoyuju, and that he must once again find the girl who who contains the spirit, who contains the magic orb, and, and protect her once again. So that way she. May May give so she may give the power to the Mugi when it comes down but of course in this day and age the the Baraki is still alive and he wants to have a chance again at taking the Yu Yuju so that way he can transcend to heaven so as far as the positives of D War well you know I gotta admit upon watching it again the special effects were good you know they were great back in the day and a lot of it still holds up to the current day yeah it's great and the spectacle is a lot of fun. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, like the name of the movie says, a lot of dragons or a lot of reptilian creatures wreaking havoc on the human world. And it's a full-scale war. You get kind of like this Lord of the Rings-style army of knights. Or you don't exactly know who or what they are, but they are covered from head to toe with armor, and they mount a lot of these dragons. Some of them fly. Some of them run like velociraptors. Some of them are tanks so you get a nice variety of creatures and they all they're all well designed and you know the spectacle that they take part in the spectacle that they cause it's a lot of fun admittedly but as far as the negatives everything else i mean this is not a good movie even to this day you know i think uh, yeah i try to find much more redeeming points about this movie now upon watching it again but i still can't i think you know the way i felt about the special effects and the spectacle were the same kind of thoughts I had back then and you know it still hasn't changed but you know where do I start with the negatives well first of all the performances are dull you know especially by the two leads I mean Jason Bear and Amanda Brooks it's like they're meant to be star-crossed lovers or rather they're, they're reincarnations of star-crossed lovers so when you first meet them well first of all their individual performances 
are very dry. They have, there is no emotional range in either one of them, and they kind of keep the same level of facial expressions and tone of voice throughout the, the entire duration of the movie. And it's just boring. It's just dull, you know? And then when they interact with each other, you're meant to believe that they eventually grow to be uh, that same level of lovers again, you know? But it just feels forced. Like, they just they just pull a kissing scene out of nowhere. No proper buildup or no proper development at all. And you're meant to believe that they, you know, they love each other in current day as they do 500 years prior. And, you know, they're the shittiest friends in the world. There's this one scene when, uh, when the girl... Uh, Sarah, I think the character's name was, when Sarah's friend gets mauled uh, by the Baraki. And then, you know, Sarah doesn't react to it. She doesn't go back to it. She doesn't even wonder, hey, I wonder if my friend is okay. She's a shitty friend. And you have Ethan, who's friends with the I can't remember the character's name, but he's played by comedian Craig Robinson. I mean, I think for the most part, Craig Robinson is the most entertaining character in this movie. Until about halfway through the movie, then it becomes dull, just like the rest of them. But, you know, he he they work uh, together in a news network channel. Uh, uh, Craig Robinson is a cameraman, and Ethan is the news reporter. And there's this one scene where they're running away from bad guys, and then Craig Robinson get, just kind of gets tossed aside. Ethan and Sarah run away, and then later on, Sarah's like, "Hey, is your friend okay?" And then Ethan's like, "Ah, don't worry, he'll be fine." It's like, dude, he's got thrown off a bridge. You're not gonna even wonder if he's okay or not. It's like, man, yeah, they're all—they're both just the shittiest friends in the world. And I thought the marketing—you know—you see the posters, the trailers. I thought it was a bit misleading. Like I said before, I, I went in to watch D.O.R. in the cinemas, hoping to see a giant kaiju versus kaiju battle. And you know, I got that. Immediately, I got it, but it was only during the final 10 or 15 minutes of the story. Everything else is pretty much the Baraki chasing the two characters around the city of Los Angeles, and also this uh, this faceless uh, knights and dragon army chasing after them. And you know, I, w I felt kind of misled. I felt kind of betrayed. I wanted a much I wanted much more of a of a brawl between the two dragons. You know, the the whole story is meant to hype up. Uh, that Sarah is supposed to give power to the good Imugi, the good dragon, so that way it can transform into the celestial dragon and ascend to heaven. However, you don't see the dra you don't see the good Imugi, uh, other than somewhere near the beginning when they go uh, into the flashback part of the story, and also the very final 10, 15 minutes. So you kind of forget that there's a good dragon that's meant to be uh, fighting the evil dragon. You don't remember that at all until the final 10 or 15 minutes. And can we talk about the bad guy for a second? I mean, the bad guy, for the most part, is faceless for the uh, for the majority of his screen time. He's covered head to toe with armor, save for a few moments when he's trying to disguise himself in different kinds of, as different types of characters, anything from a policeman or, or whatever, in order to try to, uh, try to chase down Ethan and Sarah. Uh, but you don't get, to, you don't even know who he is. He's just this guy with this distorted, deep voice who's chasing them around, and that's all. You don't care for him. He's just a guy that looks scary. And then the army is also faceless. It's just like, you know, you get to, you like the orcs in Lord of the Rings a lot more than the guy than the 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 the, the evil knights that are in D War. And you know, just they're just bodies that get that are meant to just fall when the when when they're facing the American army or the local police force. And that's something I thought that was funny. Uh, well, whenever whenever these guys get shot at, they open up like these shields out of nowhere. And these shields are tiny. They're like maybe from my arm about this much. Yet for some reason they don't move at all. They just kind of keep it in the same position. Yet they can they manage to block every single bullet that flies in their direction. It's just weird. I know it's supposed to make the bad guy army look unstoppable and look just more intimidating, but it's just kind of funny when you just think about it. You know why doesn't why don't the cops just aim lower? I mean, I can go on and on to talk about why D War is such a terrible movie. But I'm just gonna leave it right there and just say, you know, overall, yeah, it is what it is. I feel like it, you know, it's definitely an expensive movie to produce. I think at the time, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, when this movie was released, I believe it was the most expensive uh, Korean movie t uh, to date. But at the same time, you see it, you know, it has a gr has great a quality when it comes to anything visual. 
but it's definitely a B-movie at heart. You know, for those of you who like B-movies, you might have a soft spot for D-War. For those of you who are looking for, uh, like, giant monster movies, you might you might enjoy D-War to an extent. And I think overall, this is mainly a movie that can be chalked up as a guilty pleasure. For those of us who like bad movies so bad that they're good, this might fit the bill. For me, I mean, it's not, it's definitely not that case. It's just a bad movie. But I think for many people, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of those movies that are so bad as good. I mean, admittedly, you know, this movie has a lot of funny moments that don't make sense. And these moments come out of scenes that are trying to be serious, you know. But when the movie tries to do, tries to attempt comedy, it's not funny. It's just kind of awkward. Uh, and it's kind of cringeworthy at the same time. You know, okay, I see you're trying to be funny, movie, but it's not going to work. And then when the movie tries to be serious, it's like, oh man, okay, this movie is hilarious. And yeah, those are my thoughts on D-War. What did you guys think? What kind of questions did you guys have? Let me know in the comment section below. Please like, share, and subscribe. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And by all means, please support Asian Films on Patreon. It definitely helps the channel a lot. And hey, did you know I started a Discord server for those of us who want to chat more about Asian cinema? Leave a comment below and I'll extend to you a link inviting you to our Discord server so you can join in the discussion. And yeah, that's about it for me guys. And as always, everyone, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you all again in the next video. Take it easy.